Good morning, friends, from the Sanctuary of First Congregational Church, Fort Worth. I do so appreciate all of you who come to church, not in person, of course, but who tune in at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning so that we can share worship together in real time. I've been standing looking at my Facebook feed and seeing all of, the, all of you as you join, and my heart just thrills to see your names. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome. Sunday worship is this touchstone in my life, a weekly touchstone, and apparently in many of yours, since so many of you make it a point to watch at this time. It means a lot to continue to gather in community. It means perhaps now more than ever. As always, we begin worship with our words of welcome, and I hope that you'll participate with me. Come, let everyone in all of our sacred spaces receive the love of God extended in and through this community, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey. You are welcome here. We're aware this morning that we have some glitches. We always want it to be perfect, and it never is, sort of like in our lives. So we'll just carry on and deal with whatever comes. Right now, I'll tell you that right here uh, at our church, there's a storm that's moving through, and it turned very dark very quickly, and it's raining pretty heavily, so we'll just see what happens. You can hear the thunder, maybe. Now we have the chance to come together in prayer. Feel free to post any joys or concerns on the comment thread, and towards the end of the prayer, I will offer a few of those prayer concerns aloud. Let's begin this time of prayer, and, and the prayer is written by Reverend Kathy Bowser. Let's begin this time of prayer with just a moment of centering silence. Perhaps like me, you can hear the rain. It's a beautiful sound for calming our spirits. If it's possible for you uh, in your homes to take just a moment for silence and stillness as we begin our time of prayer together. On this first Sunday after Easter, O oh God, we continue to hold a new awareness of myriad resurrection, resurrections surrounding us. May we be awakened to the raising up again and again of so much good in our lives. Help us resist an inclination to dwell on what's changed or what's missing from our former routines. Today, O oh God, focus us on the essentials of being church to each other and to your larger world. What might that mean for us in this strangest time of pandemic? With the Easter messages of Jesus' transformed life still resonating within us, we ask, are there any in our world who are hungry? Help us to rise up and feed them through our donations to a food bank? Are there any in our world who are lonely? Help us to rise up and connect them, contact them by calling or sending a note. Are there any in our world who are highly vulnerable to the virus? Help us rise up to make masks or to supply materials to those sewing masks. Lead us today, O oh God, to realize, to participate in being the church now. 
And hear us now as we offer our prayers before this community of love and support. I offer prayers for our nephew who is in emergency surgery this morning. From the comment thread, joy for Sophie's 12th birthday today and thankful she is not yet a teenager. <laughs> prayers for the Navajo Nation and Indian Health Services all over the country. Prayers for a friend in Washington State whose battle with cancer is so difficult and her husband and three young daughters need our love. Prayers of thanks and joy for my niece, Mary Kate, on her 25th birthday. Happy Continuation Day to my brother, Big Wally. Prayers for our leaders to listen to experts and their hearts to care for all of us and stay with the CDC recommendations. Prayers for people with coronavirus. Prayers for those incarcerated, detention camps, and homeless who can't properly social distance. Prayers for all the healthcare and science heroes who are working to protect and save lives. Prayers of thanksgiving for time with friends on Zoom. Wisdom and discernment for our leaders that they may make compassionate and appropriate decisions to save lives. We offer these prayers, either commented or just held in the silence of our hearts. May we show through our rising up for others the truth of resurrection. Amen. Our scripture today is from the Gospel of John. I will say it's a story that I consider to be myth. So from the sacred myth of our faith, I read from John chapter 20. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. I grew up going to Sunday school every week. And this story that I've just read was one of those that always stuck with me. As a child, I suppose I always thought of Thomas as bad, 
right? Jesus had been crucified. Then the other disciples told Thomas that Jesus was alive. They had seen him with their own eyes. But Thomas refused to believe it. He demanded to see Christ for himself. Thomas was the stubborn, doubting follower of Christ who had no faith. In my child's mind, the takeaway was clear. Don't be like Thomas. Believe. Don't doubt. There are a few stories in the Gospels of Jesus appearing to the disciples after he was crucified. As I shared last week, and as we often refer to, in my mind, these stories are highly symbolic and representative of a time in the development of our faith. They are not factual stories, and they contain great wisdom if we can approach them in that way. In every one of the stories of Jesus appearing after Easter, it's clear that Jesus' followers, his closest friends, knew Jesus in a different way after his death than they did before his death. Before his death, they knew him as a finite, mortal, flesh and blood human being. Specifically, he was a Galilean Jew. If his body was typical for that time, Jesus might have stood just over five feet tall, weighed maybe 110 pounds. This would be small by today's standards, but it's considered representative of a first century male. So Jesus, 110 pounds, soaking wet, had to eat and sleep like any other human being. He was born and he died. He was crucified. After his death, Jesus' followers came to know him in a different way, in a few different ways, actually, at least according to the stories that we have in the Bible. Paul experienced Jesus on the road to Damascus as a brilliant light and a voice. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, even if we did once know Christ in the flesh, that is not how we know him now. In the gospel stories of Easter, it's clear that Jesus after Easter is different from what he was like before his death. In our text today from John chapter 20, Jesus passes through walls. He mysteriously enters locked rooms. Earlier in John, Jesus is mistaken for a gardener by the tomb. In Luke, two of his followers walk with him for some time on the road to Emmaus. They have this in-depth conversation with him without recognizing him. The post-Easter Jesus appears and then vanishes. We're not quite sure what this post-Easter Jesus is, but the Gospels' accounts all indicate that he was significantly different after his death than the flesh and blood person they had come to know before his death. Given the confusing, mysterious appearances of Jesus after his death, doesn't Thomas get a bum rap? Even though Thomas is rarely cited as an example of faithfulness, I think he should be. He's one of my favorite disciples. I might even identify with him a little bit. That's probably why he's my favorite. In several gospel passages, Thomas shows himself to be a practical, concrete sort of guy. Thomas is the kind of person who will say what's on everybody else's mind, but no one else is willing to speak up. Before he dies, for example, Jesus gives this long farewell discourse, at least according to John's gospel, Jesus assures his followers, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. Where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way to the place where I'm going. All the other disciples just nod their head like they know what Jesus is talking about, but it's Thomas who says, wait, what? We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Thomas is plain-spoken, and gutsy. He wants to understand what's going on, 
and be able to face the situation at hand. Think about it. In our gospel story today, Jesus had already shown his hands and his side to all the rest of the gathered disciples earlier when Thomas happened to not be around. And Thomas is just not the sort of person to say, if all 10 of you saw Jesus at the same time, then that's good enough for me. Thomas finds this information that the other disciples tell him impossible to believe. He wants proof. He's merely asking for the same assurance that the others have already been told. It seems like a reasonable request. He says, unless I see it, I just cannot believe it. And with these words, Thomas becomes a stand-in for all of us who want to see something for ourselves before we decide whether it's true or not. It's so easy for us to distance ourselves from Thomas by pretending that we would respond differently. If we were Thomas, we wouldn't doubt, we would believe. Doubters get no respect. We're the Rodney Dangerfield of spiritual archetypes. When we call someone a doubting Thomas, it's generally not a compliment. So we assume that Jesus was chiding Thomas with his words, have you believed because you've seen me? But why do we hear these words as scolding? After all, Jesus shows Thomas exactly what he has shown to the other disciples earlier. He offers his hand and his side. Jesus gives Thomas exactly what he needs to believe. In our culture, doubt is often viewed as a weakness. We value strong, decisive opinions and actions. If a person has a strong faith, that means that they don't have any doubt. Doubt is implied to be a bad thing when it comes to faith. That's all well and good, but maybe you too have had the experience of praying and wondering if anyone is listening, of questioning whether or not God exists. Who among us hasn't questioned the old religious formulas? I've known folks who begin to doubt and their faith crumbles, sometimes leaving them sarcastic and cynical. Maybe you are one of those folks. Some people keep their doubts, their thoughts, and their feelings about it to themselves because they don't want to be judged by people who seem to have all the answers. Others decide it's all a bunch of baloney, and they give up altogether on religious faith or traditions that seem irrelevant or outmoded. Consider this parallel. Like all parallels, it breaks down if you push it too far, but it sometimes helps us to think about things differently. During these past few weeks, months now, of pandemic, the stock market, which had been soaring, began to fall, and fall, and fall some more, then rise a little bit, and then fall again, depending on the latest effect of coronavirus and its widespread economic havoc, or on the latest press conference. For anyone with stock holdings, it's an extremely stressful time. That's an understatement. Some investors just won out altogether. They've seen the market spiral downward. They've seen their investments lose money, and for them, it's an intolerable experience. During times like that, fear rises. We're not sure what to do. Some investors respond by panicking and selling their stock, putting the cash in a metal box for safekeeping, so to speak. But financial advisors might say, that it's a perfect time to buy more when the market is down. Religious faith 
is a bit like that. Or should I say, religious doubt. When doubt creeps into our souls, it may frighten us. We may feel like hiding or running away. We may feel like opening the door to doubt, acknowledging doubt, embracing it even, is a slippery slope and we might lose it all. But what if we understood doubt as fertile ground for growing faith? Doubt prompts us to ask deeper questions, to notice things that were invisible to us before, to keep seeking out what is hidden, to test what we think we believe in order to see if it has staying power, in order to see if it has the power to sustain our lives. Tim Keller is a Presbyterian minister. He writes, a faith without some doubts is like a human body without any antibodies in it. We know what happens to a body without antibodies in it. It leaves us vulnerable. A faith without some doubt is like a human body without any antibodies in it. People who blithely go through life too busy or indifferent or afraid to ask hard questions about why they believe as they do might find themselves defenseless against either the experience of a tragedy or the long haul of a quarantine or the probing questions of a smart skeptic. A person's faith can collapse almost overnight if she has failed through the years to listen patiently to her own doubts and to engage them, to embrace them, follow them through and see where they take her. Maybe we're reluctant to confront our doubt because we're afraid that we'll find out we made a bad religious investment. On the other hand, if we are willing to take the risk and linger in the land of doubt, we may find doubt as the doorway into a vast expanse of faith. If we deny or run from doubt, we will always wonder what is or is not true for us. But if we face our doubt, we may just find that faith is real, that there exists a deeper unseen reality to our lives, that there is more to those old religious formulas than we thought. We might be surprised to discover that our trust in the universe grows simply because we had the courage to question. It takes courage to doubt. If we give ourselves permission, we may just find that faith is the best investment we could have made. Amen. Our benediction today is adapted from an Easter blessing by John O'Donohue. Um, I think it's included in the comments that we've continued to have these glitches, so we're going to post a full recording of the service. Um, I think maybe only a portion of my sermon came through, but uh, it will be available to you in a little bit. So we close with our benediction, which is adapted by John O'Donohue. In this Easter season, let us look again at the lives we have been so generously given, and let us let fall away the useless baggage that we carry, old pains, old habits, old ways of seeing and feeling, and let us have the courage to begin again. Friends, life is short, and we are no sooner here than it is time to depart again. We should use to the full the time that we still have. We don't realize all the good we can do, a kind, encouraging word or helping hand can bring 
many a person through dark valleys in their lives. We weren't put here to make money or to acquire status or reputation. We are here to search for the light of Easter in our hearts. And when we find it, we are meant to give it away generously. The dawn that rises in this Easter season is a gift to our hearts, and we are meant to celebrate it, to carry away from this holy, ancient place the gifts of healing and light and the courage of a new beginning. In the name of our God, who is our creator and our redeemer and our sustainer, go blessed friends. Amen.